Hallelujah. Let's give it up for Jesus. Amen. I am so excited, man. God is good. Let's uh, let's pray and we're going to jump right into this thing. Amen. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you, Lord God. For you, Lord God, are the one who we worship, God. You are the one, God, who is the center of our being, Lord God. You are the one, Lord God, that we cannot do nothing without, God. For apart from you, we cannot do anything, God. And so, Lord, we pray, God, that you would teach us this morning, God, that you would speak to us, God, about the heart of the matter, God. Lord, we ask for wisdom and knowledge and understanding, insight and revelation of your word, God. And, Lord, we pray, God, speak to our hearts, God. Lord, give us new hearts new minds, God, that would honor you, Lord God, the way you would have us to honor you, rather than us trying to find ways to honor you our own way. God, help us to do it your way, God, for you are Yahweh. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Hallelujah. Let's give it up for Jesus Christ one more time. I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, as you guys know, we are in a series of the book of Mark called Actions Speak Louder Than Words. Today we are diving into chapter 1, verses 1 through 23. It's a nice large portion of scripture that we're going to uh, try, God willing, to get through all of it in a timely fashion. Amen? And so today's message, as you guys see on the karaoke screen, it is called the heart of the matter. Somebody say the heart of the matter. As you guys see on the, uh, the screen, I have a picture of a human heart. The emphasis is on our heart. Whenever you hear the statement and the phrase, the heart of the matter, they're talking about the very center, the very foundation of where things are coming from, where problems are, are coming from, where good things are coming from, where, where all the things and issues in life, where they are coming from. It is the heart of the matter. One thing that we can see for sure within our society and our culture is that people are not dealing with the heart of the matter. People are only dealing with the surface. We need more programs. We need more of this. We need more of that. We need more outer things. They're trying to fix the heart by outside influence, attempting to affect inside defilement, and it would never work. It will never work. I remember as a teenager, they tried to send me uh, to a, uh, a Gateway Foundation, and tried to actually send me to Gateway Foundation in Lake Villa, right? And I also remember running away from that place because it did not affect my heart. And then they found me in the woods somewhere and brought me back, all right? Then a little bit after that, I got into a fight, and they sent me back to jail. After that, I was like, okay, seriously, I do want to change. I want, you know, change me, whatever. I got some issues. So then they sent me to Gateway uh, on the west side of Chicago, of Chicago on Independence and Taylor. And I went over there, and guess what? My heart still was not affected. I learned some really cool things, though, on the outside. I learned about addiction. I learned about, like, AA and A and all those other A's. And, and it was pretty cool, you know what I mean? But one thing I did learn was that it did not affect my heart. It gave me ways, and even the phrase that they say, fake it till you make it. How many of you have ever heard that phrase? Fake it till you make it and hope that one day you actually make it. But that one day never came for me, all right? I faked it so much that I even faked myself right back into addiction, okay? <laughs> and so this is what happens. Why did it happen like that? Why was that? Because you have individuals that are trying to attempt to change the heart by outside influence, which it could never affect inside the defilement of one's heart. Amen? The Bible says in, in Jeremiah 11, uh, 17, verse 9, and verse 10, it says, the heart is what? Right? Did it say the heart is beautiful, follow it? Follow your heart, man. Look, man, it's beating just it's beating just right for you. The tune is singing to you. Follow that thing. Every heartbeat of it. Follow it. No. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. How many things? All. Above all things. It is deceitful above murder. It is deceitful above rape. It is deceitful above immorality. It is deceitful above uh, politics. It is deceitful above racism. It is deceitful above LGBTQ. It is deceitful above how many things? All things. That, be, that means that the heart's deception have reached every section of humanity because every person has a heart. It had, they, we have a heart. And so we have a heart issue. It says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Listen to those words. Beyond cure. Cure. That means 
that there is, there is no cure outside of God for man's heart. It is beyond cure. It's beyond 12-step programs. It is beyond self-sustenance and self-will or self-ability to try to stop to do things. Does that mean people can't stop doing things? No, some people, you got some awesome, you know, beautiful atheists who stop smoking and, and stop doing these other things. But does that mean that the heart is no longer deceitful? No, the heart is still deceitful above all things and beyond cure. He goes on and asks us a question. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to to what their deeds deserve. That is a very scary thing, while also being a very beautiful thing all at the same time. The scary part is to know that God knows our hearts. And so when we're on evangelism, and even you know amongst uh, the Christian family, we hear things like, man, God knows our heart. And it is for that reason, even on evangelism, I have to tell people and look them right in the eye. And like, yes, God does know your heart. And you know what he'll say right now if you had an opportunity to hear him right now about your heart? He would say it's wicked and deceitful above measure. He would say, yes, I know your heart, and I know how wicked it is. He's not going to say, yes, I know your heart, and it has so much beautiful intentions in there that I just, look, I'm just going to let you in without anything. Just come in because you have a beautiful heart. No. He's going to look at you, no matter how many good things you do, no matter how good you think you are, no matter who you are, he will look at you, and he will respond with this text right here, saying, yes, I know your heart, and I examine your heart, and I realize that every portion of your heart is wicked, and sinful all the time. In fact, when God destroyed the world, when it came down to Noah, he destroyed it and he made a statement. He said, I know man's heart, and man's heart is wicked all the time. They think about new ways of committing sin. They think about new ways about being wicked. And it's like, because of that, I regret creating mankind, and now I'm going to destroy them, because the heart became so wicked. And so he says that I will, each person according to their conduct, he's going to reward them according to what their deeds deserve. Now see right there, we may think, okay, there's no more grace and there's no more mercy for that matter, man. Like we're about to get what we deserve. Think about that. Think about just this week alone. What do we deserve? Think about the sins you committed this week, whatever sin. Some of us instantly, probably because we're going to get into this in this word, instantly thought about somebody else. Well, at least I'm not like my wife. At least I go to church, right? At least I'm not like my husband. You know what I mean? I'm not dealing with pornography. At least I'm not like such and such. At least I have hair and a pastor don't. And his dad now, right? And, and so, like, skip, you know, like, at least I got this. And we start comparing other people and their sins, and then we try to put them on a, on a scale, if you will, on our own personal scale. And uh, for whatever reason, think about this, for whatever reason, how is it that we always come up on top when we're comparing people's hearts? Well, at least I'm not like their heart, and then, like, their scale goes down and ours goes a little higher. And then a moment like it tips the scale, we're like, okay, I'm good right there. Now I feel better about myself because at least I'm better than such and such, right? That is the wickedness and the deception of our heart literally at play right there in that, in that very statement. And so we have to understand, right? God, Jesus is saying, or God is saying this, Jesus, the word, same thing. And so he's saying this because he's trying to lead the people to a knowledge that they are in, a, in need of a savior and they're definitely in need of a new heart. But the problem with mankind is that we don't like to deal with the heart of the matter. We only like to deal with the surface things of the matter. And nine times out of ten, the surface things of the matter is never the matter that it's our fault. It's always the matter that it's somebody else's fault. That's why I act the way I act, because it's your fault. It's the speaker's fault. Weird stuff. It's the light fault. It's dog's fault. Cat's fault. Allergies' fault. It's the grass's fault. Why did my neighbor have to, to mow the lawn? He knows I got allergies. Now I can't go to church. And we, we blame everybody. It's sleep's fault. It's Facebook's fault. It's Google's fault. It's YouTube's fault. Why they got to be so interested and keep my attention all the way up until 4 in the morning that I miss my alarm clock to go to church? It's everybody else's fault but our own. It's the culture's fault. It's Biden's fault. In fact, it's Trump's fault, even though he hasn't been in office for X amount of time. It's everybody's fault, but except my fault. Right? It's everybody's fault. But it's not my fault. And that leaves a very grave hole within our lives. Because we're living at a time where nobody takes ownership. We're living at a time where it's like it's just you, you, and you. And darn it, it's your cat and your dog too. Both of y'all. You know what I mean? It's all the whole household. But it's not me. No, it's not me. No, it's not me. 
right? It is you. So Jeremiah comes to a grave conclusion in considering the heart of man. It is deceitful above all things and beyond cure and or without human possibility of, of repair. He concludes with a question that may be considered a statement to possibly give uh, uh, that to possibly give or give us the ability to attempt to honestly answer this question regarding the heart. Who can understand it? Throughout salvation history, the questions and attempts to understand the heart, both on a scientific scale and a logical scale, cosmological scale, all these other different kind of scales and, and areas of thought and, and study, all of them try to understand the very heart to which we came up with different kind of conclusions that we need to talk about. Amen? And so they came up with the heart of the center, or the heart one is the center of people's being which have been pursued with different answers from different perspectives and trains of thought. Some say it is inevitably good. You ever heard that about the heart? Well, man's heart is, you know, as we've seen, as we, as we study that, they're inevitably good. People would, would normally not steal from the job, right? They're inevitably good. People would normally just choose to do the right thing, right? right? How many people heard that before? I heard that as I was getting my master's degree. I heard those things like, well, the heart is pretty good. It's, you know what I mean? Like, above all things, like, it's good. And I'm like, what Bible are you reading? Like, where did you get this conclusion? Can I see the test tubes? Whose heart are you testing? Is it Satan's? Because he's de he is deceiving himself. He comes as an angel of light. You know what I mean? Deceives many of us, right? And so they come out and they say things like, you know, it's inevitably good, right? And so while good may come from one's heart, which is true, right? We can all do some good things, right? Uh, 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 Richard Hawkins, the great, you know, one of the, 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 one of the greatest like atheists of our time, he did some pretty good things, right, with his money, things like that. He was capable of doing good, but he was still an atheist. But he was still able to do good. One would have to define what is good when an individual makes the statement and says, well, human being's heart is inevitably and overall good. We have to then define what is good. Is it good because they're not stealing from the job, but they're stealing time from the job when they take extra lunches? Is the heart still good? Is it good because they're not stealing whole computers, but they're just stealing paper and little minute things? Is that still a good heart? Right? And so you move on from there. You have to define what is good. While some would say that the heart has a dual essence, right? These are other people with the potential to be both good and bad, right? Anybody heard that? Well, the human heart is both filled with good and is both filled with bad. And some and most of them choose good, but then again, we have to define what is good and what is bad, right? And so while this can be seen in our day-to-day -day, uh, encounters with people, right, people that are committing murders in Chicago and carjacks and things like that, believe it or not, those same people do some good stuff in some, war, some way, form, or another. They still may love grandma and still go home and take care of grandma, throw out her trash and, and clean up her house. And then right after that, go out the door or whatever, sell a pack of drugs, and then go to the corner and shoot somebody three times. Having still the capability of doing good. This is the heart, and this is the heart of man. The word even goes on to further, uh, further, it goes a step further to pose a question. Who can understand it? And the answer to these questions may be sheer experience or by sheer experience, right, of our own, myself. You guys can just kind of look around. That not even the person whom the heart belongs to understands their own heart, let alone any attempts by others outside of that heart. Do you guys understand that? It says, who can understand it? The reality is not even the person that the heart is beating in can understand their own heart. They can, let alone people outside the heart. You ever been with somebody that don't even understand their own heart? And you can't even understand their heart, but you make attempts to, only to fail big time. You expect them to have the kind of heart that you want them to have and that they should have. And then when they fail, you're the same person that would be quick to blame them. But then there's a caveat that you refuse to see the very bad heart that's in your own heart. Think about that for a little bit and I messed up your whole mindset. All right? Most of us should be crying right now. And so, yet it is the Lord who declares. I search the heart and examine the mind. That's to say, I know it all together, and it is deceitfully and wicked and can only be cured by God. It is this deceptiveness of man's heart that has been ignored time and time again to our own demise that we attempt to be led by our hearts only to be let down and create more confusion, 
division, and even delusion to ourselves and others around us who are affected by the decisions we make with a deceptive heart we refuse to allow God to deal with. It is because we end up being tempted or even choose to be led by our hearts that we make some of the most foolish decisions. And then after that, we put God's name in it. Well, I heard that from God. You heard God tell you to have a divorce because they don't cook the way you want them to cook. You heard God to have a divorce because they no longer want to be Christians. Your heart is deceitful above measure. You heard God to leave that church because of X amount of reasons but you never blamed yourself or even asked yourself, did you do everything that God called you to do in that church in the get-go? Your heart is deceitful above measure. And so it is with that same heart that we end up causing confusion in our households, confusion in our churches, division in and out the church, even delusion, because we become delusional because of our own hearts to ourselves and even other people. We end up saying things like, man, I feel like God is will to go on ahead and, and do this right here. And then the week after that, you're like, man, I feel like it's God's will to go this way. I feel like it's God's will to move to Maine. And then next week after that, because you've seen a movie or whatever, like House on the Prairie, you're like, I want to now move to Kentucky or some whatever country land is over there. And you're like, dude, I thought last week you were going to Iraq. Now this week you're going to Russia. Where are you going? And it's like, dude, I don't even know. My heart beats this way and that way and upside down and round and round. And I think I'm supposed to be everywhere at one time. I might be God. And I'm like, your heart is definitely delusional. Let's pray because you have now entered into the twilight zone. And so we have to understand that we have to give our hearts to God and let God lead them. Because when God does not lead our hearts, we end up leading our own hearts astray and that to our own demise. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I like that because last week, as, as uh, Derry was preaching a very awesome message last week, if you guys missed it, please catch it on the website. The man did an awesome job. One of the sections in that section of, of Mark, it talked about that the hearts of the disciples were hardened. They were hard. Why? Because they were trying to understand that, uh, about Jesus Christ something that they could not understand at the time. And so their heart got hardened because they couldn't see that Jesus was in fact the Son of God. God himself in the flesh. And the Bible says their hearts were hardened. Why is that important to know? Because the moment we stop looking at Jesus for who he is and we start being led by our own hearts, it would always 100% of the time end up hard. How do you know, Pastor, I can still serve God and, and my heart's not hard right now? Well, let's sit down and let's, let's ask the question, what is it to serve God? What is it to worship God? What is it to go to church? Right? What is it for these things? Because, again, sometimes we only go to the surface of them. And then when you sit down with like a mature Christian who knows the word of God, they're able to break it down and say, man, it looks like your heart has gone hard. It's gotten hard toward God. No, it ain't, Pastor. You just use your own interpretation. Man, I read the I read the New King James Version, the King James Version. You read that old crazy NIV version. And I'm like, listen, King James wasn't even a Christian. Think about that for a little bit. But yet he made the King James Bible. That's another discipleship, maybe time or something like that, or sermon. And so God knows we need a new heart and promises to give us one. But the question is, do we know we need a new heart? Do we know that for ourselves? And I like to speak about spouses, right? Because everybody, you know, most people here either had a spouse uh, once, had a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is. And at this time, it is so easy to kind of connect this and be like, I knew that my partner's heart <laughs> was a jacked up heart. And at that time, we only think about like our neighbor's heart. Like my neighbor's heart is so jacked up. They leave poop all over the yard or whatever. My dog steps in and now she has a parasite and now I got to do all the stuff. Their hearts are bad. And then we forget our own hearts, right? And like the poop that we forgot like three days ago that's in the other yard that nobody has seen yet or came across. And so when it comes down to it, we have to today take out our pride, take out that lack of beating heart because the heart is so stoned and put it in your hand today. Don't put your spouse's heart in your hand today or any day for that matter. Don't put your neighbor's heart there. Don't put your boss's heart there. Do not put grandma's heart there, mama's heart, aunt, sisters, whatever. I want us to grab our own hearts today, and as I continue with this message, 
I want us to look at our own hearts. I want us to ask what our hearts are beating for, from, with, to, right? Where is our heart at in light of the heart of the matter? Amen? And so the word of God, there's a lot of text here, right? I had to put it in one slide, pray for your pastor, right? And then I can barely see myself. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to read out of this very small text, right? I just petitioned for a new Bible. Pray for me, guys, that I'll get a bigger letter Bible. But here I go. You guys are ready? Chapter 7, right, of Mark. The title of, of this one says, That which defiles. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with his hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Somebody say, saw. Wow. Right? Verse I can't really see it, but I think it's verse 3, right? The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition, somebody say tradition, of the elders. When they come from uh, the marketplaces, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Somebody say observe. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating with their food with defiled hands? You guys see what they just said right there? They did, yeah, I'm definitely going to do that, right? So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, they kind of Jesus with this nonsense, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders? Not, why doesn't your disciples live in, uh, in accordance to your word, to the word of God? No, to the traditions of your elders, or the elders, instead of eating their food with defiled hands. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. You know, I got to say it like that, because I don't know what Bible other people are reading, right? This little nice Jesus Bible stuff. But listen, Jesus was a savage, okay? This man was a son of God, right? He was the God-man. He didn't hold his tongue and was trying to be politically correct and trying to be nice-ianity, right? Like Christianity, but nice-ianity, right? You got to be nice, Pastor. You can't be talking about sin and, and hell and all these other things because people are going to think you're not nice. They're going to think you're hell and brimstone. I don't care, right, what they think. I just care about what my Savior thinks, and I have to preach this word. This isn't black and white. It's not my interpretation. I'm, I haven't even got there yet, okay? This is Jesus saying this. He replied to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. These were the most prominent people of the day. And they didn't just come from anywhere. They didn't just come from like Squaw Community Church. These dudes came from Jerusalem, which is the main headquarters of these Pharisees and these, and these teachers of the law who were the actual scribes. These were the creme of the creme of the examples of the Torah of the Old Testament. These were the people who actually taught the Mosaic law and the people who had prestige in the culture. These were pastors and teachers of our day and age. Let's just say that for contextualization, right? And Jesus tells them, I love my Jesus. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied, not about anybody, but about you. Hypocrites. That hurts to tell. So hypocrite is like kryptonite in the Christian church. Even though we have a lot of hypocrites in the church, Oh, we hate to be called a hypocrite. That'll cause somebody to leave the church, even though it may be true, like they are hypocrites. It'll cause somebody to never come back to church. Here goes Jesus, who don't care about, you know what I mean, whether you come back or not. You're a hypocrite, as it is written. These people, here it is, check the heartbeat in your hand right here. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to human traditions. These are the people who are the examples of the commandments of God and the teachers of the commandments of God. He's saying you let them go for your own teach for your own traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your, your own traditions. Exclamation mark. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Most of us here should be dead already if we were in Old Testament law, right? I know I would have been dead. My brother definitely would have been dead. I probably would have killed him, whatever, right? Like, honor your mother and your father. We would have been some dead people because I did not honor my mother or my father or anybody else for that matter. I would have been dead, stoned to death 
by whoever thought they were better than me, right? Whatever, right? And so this is real stuff, but thank God for his mercy and fulfillment of the law that we are no longer being stoned because of this. We can actually repent and get a new heart, amen? If that's you, get a new heart. You have a fine way. Okay, we talk about that. And so, and anyone who curses their father or mother should be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin or that is devoted to God, then you are no longer, uh, you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify, somebody say nullify, the word of God by your tradition that you have hand it down and you do many things like this again jesus called the crowd to him and said listen to me everyone and understand this nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them nothing rather it is what comes out of a person that defiles them after he had left the crowd and entered the house he his disciples uh, asked him about this parable and this is jesus response are you so dull just that jesus that that you know for other people don't talk like this. Jesus just talks very nice. He doesn't deal with our sin. He just kind of lets us go. He's like, I just love everybody. Come on down. Let's sing Kumbaya and go from there. No, he calls his own disciples like, are you so dull? Are you so dull? And then he moves on. He asks, don't you, ha don't you see that nothing that enters a person from outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their hearts, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Thank God, right, that I could eat lechon and not worry about this stuff, right? There was a time where I, my first job that I received after, you know, being incarcerated, I ended up bumping into a quote-unquote Christian, right? And he was one of these kind of Christians that Jesus was talking to. And I remember he asked me, do you eat pork? It was around the holidays. I said, dude, I tear that stuff up. And he's like, you're defiled. How dare you eat pork? And I was on this thing called a high-low. How many know I wasn't like all the way there with God at this time, right? And so I was so tempted to run this guy over to show him how defiled he is as he smelled like weed and everything else. And he's talking to me about my defiled heart because I eat pork. And I'm looking, I'm like, dude, you smell like weed right now. But you're talking about me eating pork. What is wrong with you? And then he just kept on with the whole Old Testament law about me eating pork. And I just kind of drove away and just took off on him. And it just went from there. I'm like, dude, I'm just going to leave you in your tracks, let you deal with that, okay? And so then it goes from there, right? He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murders, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and uh, folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Got to understand that everything that Jesus named right there was things that treat other people. Murder, sexual immorality, everything else, it had to do with treating other people. And they're saying, listen, your heart is defiled and evil. And so, the Pharisees and teachers of the law and scribes came from Jerusalem. We talked about that. The very place Mark is quickly moving towards where Jesus will be crucified and crucified by the same people proclaiming to be the very teachers of the law and examples of keepers of the law. These same people will go out and try to or try or kill Jesus. They begin to think about murder in the heart. The same people who are pointing at the disciples and saying, look at your disciples. They're eating food with defiled hands. The same people that a little bit ago just started plotting to murder Jesus. Do you see what happens there? I'm thinking about murdering Jesus while at the same time I'm concerned that one of our brothers are eating food, right? Or let's say like a hibarito or something like that, right? He's about to eat a hibarito sandwich or something, right? With dirty hands. Because he didn't use uh, that germ X, the, what's the, the, what, the Purell, the, the hand sanitizer. And all of a sudden, because we're like in mid-COVID or whatever you guys want to call it, <gasps> how dare you not sanitize your hands? You're defiled now. I don't want to eat with you no more. You're so nasty. And God will use that example and say, do you understand how nasty your heart is? Do you understand that before you even told that brother that, you had lusted over, you know what I mean, this lady over here? In your heart, and you worried about hand sanitizer? The heart of the matter. Amen? But this is how we all act, right? To a certain degree. And so they came who would one day crucify Jesus, same people. They did not come from Jerusalem to be friends and follow Jesus. Let's get that out the way, right? But to contend with Jesus and find accusations against the Lord. As they gathered around the Lord, they saw some of Jesus' disciples eating foods with hands that were defiled. 
which led them to ask Jesus why his disciples don't live according to the traditions of the elders, but instead defile their traditions. Jesus uses this as an example or an opportunity to teach about true defilement and that from the heart in contrast to their false matters of defilement. All right? This section of Mark's gospel teaches us the heart of the matter when it comes to defilement and the dangers of our traditions. The definition of traditions, I'm not going to have it on the screen. Listen carefully. It is the handing down of information. The handing down of information. Right? Beliefs and customs by word of mouth or by example from one generation to another without written instruction. How are people being handed down information today? What are some of the methods? Facebook, social media, news media, right? Mainstream media. Come on, somebody, right? The culture, politics, right? Uh, governors, you know, aldermen, all these other things, right? It's coming from the world, and the information is being handed down. The issue is this, just like with the Pharisees. They stood on the information of tradition while letting go the information of God's commandments. It is so easy to get caught up in the information that's being handed down to us by the, by the world itself and the culture that even though it goes against Scripture, many of us are putting aside Scripture to hold on to the traditions of this world. And guess what's happening? The church itself is being defiled. It's being defiled as we now have pastors who are literally and living in a homosexual relationship. It is defiling against the word of God. It is coming down where it's like we put premise on things that really don't matter on the, on the outside surface of color while literally refusing to deal with one's heart of the matter. And it can go on. Murder. Adultery. Right? Right? Why is it that in the church, divorce rate is exactly the same, if not more, than those in the world? Why is that? Because people that are being married, even in the church, are refusing to deal with one's heart. Instead, they're only dealing with the surface of things. We're not going to deal with the fact that you have three marriages, and all the marriages ended the same. We're just going to blame the other person. It's the girl's fault. And just like, Pastor, look, I just can't find that one. I just can't find that girl. And then I would say something like this, because you guys know me, I'm just going to be straight, straight blunt and straight to the heart. What about the fact that God did attempt to give you three wives, and all three of these wives you end up destroying because you refuse to deal with your own heart? Right? And so we have this information being handed down to us, but this is the problem that we're having now within our society is that we're not lining up the very information that's coming from year after year after year, different, different president, different president, different president, and all these other things that are going on in our society. We're not lining up with the word of God. So guess what happens? We are now being deceived by winds of doctrines. And this week we believe that homosexuality is a sin, while next week we believe it's awesome. We put a, we put a rainbow flag. It don't even mean promise of God no more. And now it means this thing now. And we change the very word of God to suffice the very culture we live in. It's no longer information coming from the word of God. It's information coming from the world that we are now settling with and defiling the very word of God we claim to stand on. And so the dangers of our, tra are our traditions in the face of God's commandments. We will learn three things that happen to us when we do not make the heart of the matter the matter of the heart. Amen. And three things that happen to us when we make the heart the heart of the matter. Two different areas. We're going to fall into one of these categories. The objective is this. Can today we ask God for a new heart? Amen? The very first one is when we do not make the heart the heart of the matter. I'm talking about our own heart. Our own heart. What begins to happen, right? Number one, we become legalistic. Ooh, people hate that word, legalism. Ooh, some people will do like Jesus and be just so righteous or whatever, start flipping over tables. Oh, that's it, I'm so done with this stuff. Oh, you guys suck, but I'm awesome. And it's like we all go from there and we start doing all this other craziness, but we're living in legalism. When we do not make our hearts the heart of the matter, we become legalistic. Legalistic. In this time, we have to understand in the first, what is the first five verses? 
You see that the Pharisees and teachers of the law who were described came into town from Jerusalem to gather around Jesus. And it wasn't a gathering like the disciples gathered around to glorify God. No, it was a gathering so that they can point fingers at Jesus using his disciples who were breaking the traditions of the elders. And it said, Jesus, what's up with your disciples? Why did they do that? Because they were literally trying to find fault with Jesus himself. A, a teacher who had disciples were responsible for their disciples. You want to know why I try to keep you guys accountable? Because you guys are representatives of Squad Community Church and a representative of the pastor who's teaching you. So whenever, whenever it happens, they see you guys on the streets and y'all going to the club or whatever, high as a kite, doing all type of stuff, tripping on shrooms or whatever you guys are doing, or you're married and you're not supposed to be doing something, you know, or out there or whatever, you're supposed to be at home taking care of business and you're doing something else. And they know that, man, they come from Squad Community Church. Guess two things are going to happen. That church sucks, number one. And what is that pastor teaching them? He must be backslidden with them. That's literally what happens. And so what happens? I teach and I preach the way I do. So that even though they're still going to say that, unfortunately, and they do say that, right? We get, I get persecuted a whole lot, right? And so, but I give God glory for it. I'm going to keep on preaching the way God has called me to keep preaching, right? Because it's what it is. I'm one audience one. And so what ends up happening is, listen, I'm going to tell you what it is. And after that, it's like I had a conversation this week. You ask the person, right? After that, I'm going to tell you just like this. Your blood is not on my hands no more. I am a watchman of the people. And a watchman of the people gives the people the word of God. And then they step back and they say, God, I did your will. I told them what you told me to tell them. Their blood is now on your hands. God, have your way. And then guess what? I'm not going to cry at night for that. Because I don't cry enough for you praying even to give you that word, right? And so after that, it's like, God, your will be done. Who am I to go against your will? If you choose to destroy these people or whatever, their marriages, their whatever's going on in their lives, God, hallelujah, praise God, I give you the glory, God. That is on you. Because I did my part. Their blood is not on my hands no more. After that, what I got to do? Keep on messing with the other disciples that are still here that God wants me to do. I cannot get hung up on one person, two people, three people, five people. I got to do what God has called me to do, whether you guys like me or not. Hopefully you guys like me, become good friends. If not, I'm still going to preach and teach and do God's way anyway. So God bless you guys really, really good. And so they came in here, and what happened was in the first five verses that they described the traditions of the Pharisees. And one thing you can see when you take a step back is that the Pharisees and the scribes were legalistic. They came not to have their own heart dealt with. They came to point fingers at everybody else and say how defiled your disciples are. Look at this guy over here. Look at this girl over here. Look at they're eating with dirty hands. They're defiled. While the whole time their hearts were beating for murder against Jesus. Beating for it. And so the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes became legalistic in their religiosity because they did not make their hearts the heart of the matter. A legalistic person is always on the prowl looking to see others, others' mess or mess ups and point it out while conducting similar sins or other sins they refuse to discuss. You guys ever bump into a legalistic person? It's amazing how these people are. It's so grieving. And so listen. A legalistic person will point out the bad you presume to be doing through their own traditions or false interpretations of the word while conducting the same presumed wrongdoing in a different way, but equates to the same accusation made toward others. Can we talk about some of these? Number one, let's say tattoos. We live in a tattoo culture, right? Even pastors are getting tattoos. just like all random and all that, right? Pray for them, right? I get tattoos, whatever it is. A legalistic person will come that believes that tattoos is a sin. Let's talk about it, right? Then all of a sudden, they're going to use that scripture in the Old Testament, right, in Deuteronomy. Or, and so they're going to use that, that scripture, right? Look, man, the Bible says that you're not supposed to be marking up your bio for your body for the dead and all these other things or whatever, right? And then we're looking at them like, okay. And they said they come at me, right? Legalistic. Look at that. My body is pure. It's the, it's the body of the, it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And look at your body. Just stretch out your arms, Pastor. And I stretch them out and they see all these little tattoos on me and stuff like that. And I look at you. You're defiled. And I looked back at them and I asked them a simple question. Brother, how much you weigh? Well, you know what? I'm at 300 right now. Brother, you worried about my tattoos and you're sitting here obese and you're still the temple of the body of, of, body of Christ? You coming at me with tattoos and yet in your heart you have gluttony. I know we don't want to talk about that, but we got to talk about it. We can say ouch or we can say amen, but it's the truth, right? And so I don't have time to break down tattoos and show you guys that it's not a sin, but that's for another time, some other time. Let's talk about another one. Alcohol. Woo! 
alcohol. Everybody on live is like, yes, alcohol, let's go. No, you guys watch yourselves or you might be in sin, okay? And so this is the thing, alcohol, right? Very controversial things, but legalistic people love to draw off it. The worst one I've heard, this is a true story, I'm not going to use any names. This is the worst one I heard on a legalistic side. And they were literally spurting and, and just blasting me all over Facebook with it, right? And so this is what I heard. Bro, I can't believe it. I came from a place where they were taking shots or whatever. And like, listen, that was just so sinful, but I still drink alcohol. I just don't do that kind. I do like wine or something or beer. And it's like, <laughs> now wait a minute. Hold on. All right. Now let's be honest with you. I know it sounds funny, but we got to deal with this stuff, right? This is legalism at its finest. You're saying I'm a false pastor, whatever the case may be, because I might have a drink of some hard liquor, right? Not drunk, nothing like that, right? But I have that. But you're better than me because you drink wine or beer, get tipsy off it, and I'm the bad one. This is legalism at its finest. It's got to be totally honest here. Right? I know it's a hot topic. A lot of people don't like to talk about liquor or whatever, but this is what it is. This is the word of God. We got to deal with it. The Bible says in the word of God, Whatever you do, do unto the Lord. Whether you eat or drink, do unto the Lord. That is why I tell people, don't be posting that stuff on Facebook. That is between you and the Lord. The moment you post it on Facebook, you are in sin, brother or sister. And not only that, the Bible says, do not judge your brother or sister whether they eat or drink. So guess what happens? You can show these people these scriptures. And you know what they say? But still, I don't do it so you shouldn't do it. It's wrong. No, you're legalistic and you need a new heart. That's what's right. Can I get an amen? amen? Right? And just to say, we're not a church out here getting drunk, things like that. We have people that, that live in sobriety in our church. One of, our, one of, our, one of the people or whatever is about to celebrate about eight years plus or whatever. Praise the Lord. Can we give God, God glory for that, right? We have recovering addicts in the house. Praise the Lord. We have recovering from liquor and drugs and all type of things. And God is good. Amen? And so, but these are the legalistic things that people come at us with and each other. And the only thing is this. It is to put themselves on a scale and hope that it would tip, that they end up on top and you end up on the bottom. Because that's what legalism does. And you know what else it does? It only causes division. It only causes confusion. And it causes disruption within the body of Christ. These individuals that are legalism draw off emotions. They draw off self-traditions. They draw off commandments that are not even based upon the commandments of God. It's based upon the commandments of traditions of themselves. It is legalism. And any time we become legalistic, we become like the Pharisees, and we point to people. Look at them. It's their fault. Look at what they're doing. Oh, they suck. Oh, but pastor this. Oh, but his mom that. His dad that. Now look at his brother that. And all this other stuff. Why don't you look at the fact that they're saved and sanctified by Jesus Christ? They were once lost, and now they're found. And you want to talk about these people? Let's talk about God's saving grace in that matter. The real grace, not the hyper grace, the real grace of God upon their lives. Amen? And so legalistic in that manner. Those are the examples of it. Amen? Look what the word of God has to say in regards to these things. Can we read the word in church? Colossians 2, 20 on down, right? Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, that is the traditions, that is the false commandments and all these other things, talking about the elemental spiritual forces, right? Why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to, the, to its rules? And then look at the rules. Do not handle. Do not taste. Do not touch. All outside things. All external things. We draw off them and make them so big. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance, somebody say an appearance, of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility. Look at what the, the words are using here. Right? I don't got time to break all this stuff down. They have a self-imposed worship, all about me worship. Look what I can do worship. Look at all the cartwheels and the swirls I can do, right? Look at how good I can sing. Look at how good I can, you know, do whatever it is, whatever it is. It is a self-imposed worship, truly worshiping of self and not worshiping of God, even though they're singing worship songs. We've been had those people here and those people since left. God bless them really good, right? And so their false humility, they don't have a real humility. It is a false humility. How do I know if it's a false humility, pastor? You would know it by the pride that they exhibit on a daily basis. You would know it how they slander other people. 
You would know it how they exalt themselves above everybody else. You would know it how they spread rumors about the other people. You would know it that they will never go to the source of the issue or the source of the person they have an issue with. They will do it behind closed doors and talk about other people, but would never do what the word of God actually says and says, brother, if you have an issue with your brother, leave your gift at the altar, go to your brother and make it right. And then come back and offer your gift. Instead, skip the scriptures. I'm going to talk about them over here. Stupid old pastor. Right? And say some old, old dumb old stuff like that, right? Y'all need to leave that church, man. Yeah, they on that old hell and brimstone stuff, man. They on that whole hardcore preaching. They always talking about hell or whatever. They must not care about us. What the? That, I, let me get off my soapbox. So let's keep going, right? And so in their harsh treatment of the body. Some people are so legalistic and so religionalistic that they do all these things to the body, right, on the outside. While on the inside, that heart is so dark and so defiled, right? They torment and treatment of the body. But listen to this. But they lack any value in restraining sensual things that are happening on the inside. Indulgences. Man, look at you, man, looking at that girl's booty, man. Man, you bogus. You need to repent, dude, for real, man. Go home and watch pornography and, and commit self-pleasure. And this is, just keep it like that. And they come the next day or they start spreading rumors. I mean, I've seen this, I've seen that. But never want to say, hey, man, I'm dealing with pornography, man. Pray for me, man. I might have seen this on the outside, but I'm dealing with some stuff on the inside. Come on, right? I know we don't want to talk about these things, but we got to because God says so. Amen. I love you guys still, though. <laughs> Colossians 2a says, see to it that no one takes you captive. This is a command right here for every single person in here. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. They remove the emphasis about Jesus and they put it on themselves. And when it's on yourself, guess what? It's no longer about Jesus the Christ. It is about you trying to be somebody else's Messiah based upon your own traditions and your own commandments. Why does pastor got to pray like that? Why he got to stand on these, why he's got to preach like that? Why he's got to teach like that? Why, 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 why? And the whole time it's like, why can't you just pray? Why can't you just read your Bible? Why can't you just do the basic elementary things of Christianity in your life? You sitting here worried about my life. Ouch. All right, man. Number two, we become hypocrites. Oh, that word. Kryptonite. We become hypocrites. The Bible says in verses 6 and 7, what did Jesus reply? Isaiah was right about you when he wrote about you. You hypocrites, right? You come to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You worship me in vain, right? Your worship is based upon human commands, traditions, based upon oneself. It's about them. We become hypocrites. The definition of a hypocrite is this, pretenders. It's pretenders. You pretend. You're a Christian when you're in church. But when you go home, you don't pick up that Bible. There's nothing to be filtered with the Word of God, right? You have a guru on the side, and that's where you get your wisdom and knowledge and understanding, right? And so if you have a guru, man, please introduce me to him, man. I would like to meet the dude. But nonetheless, right, we become hypocrites just like the Pharisee and the scribes. If we're looking at everybody else. And while they're doing this, making it seem like they were so close to God with their lips, their heart was far from God, far from God. So even to the point where Isaiah says, bro, your worship is in vain. You worship God in vain. He ain't even trying to honor your worship. He ain't even trying to hear your worship. Why? Because you're living this double life. You're living this pretending life. That on the outside, everything is cool and dandy, but on the inside, God says, I see right through that stuff. And I would hope you get saved lest that time comes and I spit you out of my mouth because you are lukewarm. And anybody that gets spit out of the mouth of God, let me tell you something right now, you're not going to heaven. Hence the reason he spits you out of him. Only those who are in Christ Jesus are children of God. Those that have been spitted out of Christ Jesus are no longer the children of God. He's spitting you out with a reason because you're a lukewarm. Living one life here and living a, other, a different life somewhere else. We can say ouch and we can say amen. Amen. And so someone who puts on a mask and pretends to be something that he is not. 
in the context of how Jesus meant it, was that the Pharisees and the scribes were accusing the disciples of eating with hands that were defiled, yet themselves being defiled in their hearts. Because they never made the heart the heart of the matter, and instead choose to make the outer parts of themselves the matter, it led to hypocrisy. You see how that, that affects us? When we never deal with our hearts and look at our own hearts, we read the Bible through a filter of everybody else's life, except our own. We read the Bible with our spouse's uh, life in our minds. We read the Bible with somebody we don't like in mind or a Christian that we don't like in church. And we read the Bible through those lenses. And so it's never our heart that is on the trial of ourselves. The Bible says examine your own heart to make sure it is still in the faith. Amen? And so it's never our hearts there when we're reading it. We're always reading the Bible and praying. And it's always about somebody else's heart that's in our hand. And we read it like, man, I, I'm going to go on and just tell Pastor this next week. I'm so tired of this stuff, right? I'm going to tell him how bogus he is. I'm going to tell him, man, and listen, man, you got to start preaching that love gospel now. You don't have too much love in your thing. And they come at me with that stuff. And I said, brother or sister, what about the love of, just, of Jesus, for Jesus, not for your pastors? I'm just a man doing the will of God, right? But what about the love of Jesus that causes you to obey God? But you want to come at me because you're thinking that I'm not preaching, I guess, the love gospel, whatever it is. But do you understand how much love it takes to tell somebody that if you don't go, if you don't turn around and repent, you're going straight to hell? You understand when a doctor tells you, they don't, nobody does this to doctors, though. It's a trip. Like my, my job, I'm an HIV tester and counselor. When I go in and I test people with their blood and they have HIV, I can't sit here and tell them, you know what, you're doing amazing. You're going to be good. Keep going forward, man. I'm going to give you a number of love. Let me give you a hug. I'll holler at you, man. Keep doing good. Keep having sex, you know, doing your thing, whatever. You're going to be all right. No. In love, I got to tell the person, listen. Unfortunately, your test has came back HIV positive. Can we talk? Some of them lose it, whatever it is, right? So I have to count them, I have to talk to them. But in love, I still got to tell them, bro, if you don't get it right, you're going to die. You will die. None of us want to kill doctors for saying this. But we all want to kill pastors for telling us the truth and try to run us over with your cars on evangelism day, right? Like my brother just got ran over last time we were out there, and I was like, man... That would have sucked big time. I would have tried to pray for resurrection, but I would have gave God glory that he laid his life down for Jesus. But you guys understand what I'm saying? Praise the living God for that. Amen. So listen, right? So they put emphasis on portraying to be holy and pious by attempting to have the outside look good while neglecting their defiled actions of the inside. They accuse the disciples of being defiled based on not ceremonially cleaning their hands before eating, while these same people did things they were defiling, if not worse, than the disciples, and that from the heart. Could you imagine if every disciple in every single church rather looked at their own heart rather than everybody else's heart? Could you imagine how we would flip this world right side up? Total transformation. It would no longer... Could you imagine marriages? We would literally defy the percentage of divorce in the church. It would be null and void. Could you imagine if a husband came into the marriage and they had a conversation with their spouse and for the first time it wasn't about their spouse, it was about them? Baby, I just want to go in and tell you, man, that you know what? I haven't been treating you right this week. I know we had about 35 arguments, man, and 34 of them I slept on the couch and you slept in the bed. Probably me because you forced me. But no, I don't want to talk about that part, but just I want to talk about me, right? And so I'm wrong. I'm so sorry. You know what I mean? Like, listen, I was praying and God was dealing with my heart. And I just want to apologize to you. And so you know what? Going forward, this, from this day forward, I promise you I'm going to let God deal with my heart. Could you imagine if marriages start doing that stuff? Instead, the complete opposite happens. Can I get an amen? Unfortunately. Instead, we have those conversations and they start off like this. I'm so done with you and tired of you. You always come at me this way, that way, and all the way, and all the way. Thank you so much. Come at me with this, that, and the other, and you know what? I'm getting so tired of you. Your snoring is getting out of hand. Your feet stink or whatever, and I don't know the last time you changed those joggers that you had on right now. And so, could you imagine we can, you know, that, that's the, some of the conversations we have. You talk to me like trash, this, that, and the other, whatever, you know what I mean? You don't love me the way I, I want to be loved, and, and all these other things. This, this is the conversation we have. But you, could you imagine if roles reversed, and instead of looking at the heart of somebody else, we're looking at our own hearts? Hypocrisy will be eradicated. There will be none of that. If we sat there and made our own hearts the heart of the matter. And instead, because we only deal with the surface, and whenever we deal with the surface, I don't know why it's like this, probably because of our own pride and selfishness. Whenever we deal with the surface, it's never about our surface. It's about the other person that we see doing the bad. That's what it is. Why don't you massage me more? 
why don't you serve me more, in a nutshell? We do it with the church. I didn't come to serve in the church. Why don't you guys serve me? Why am I not getting phone calls throughout the night and 12 and 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 24 hours a day? I know you guys work full-time jobs and pastor got two jobs and whatever it is, but why doesn't he call me like 24 hours a day? Do you, do you like know how selfish that is, how hypocritical that is? And then I got to respond and say, when is the last time you called me? When is the last time you asked the pastor, and this is going all over, all over church, when is the last time you asked the pastor what you can pray for the pastor about? In, in, in your church, those listening online. When is the last time you went to your leader that constantly and is responsible, your disciple, of taking care and watching over your life? When is the last time you called them and took them out to eat and say, man, thank you for taking the time to minister to me and my life and my family and my children and my marriage? When is the last time? We don't. Because the reason why? We're too busy just looking at your heart and how wrong you are for not serving me the way I want you to serve me. And we do the same thing with God. We look at God's heart and we make accusations toward God very subtly because he doesn't answer our prayers the way we want them answered. He doesn't come through the way he, we want him to come through. He's not the God the way we want him. He's not, you know, uh, the genie in Aladdin's lamp. And we look at God like, man, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do my own thing. As though God is a hypocrite himself, as though he's a liar or even capable of lying. We do this because we're not looking at our own hearts. We blame everybody else except the hypocrite that we're looking at in the mirror. And so we need to imagine and get to a point where it's like enough is enough. God, my heart is the heart that matters. Because I can't go tell my brother how bogus he is or even help him if my heart is bogus. How can I help somebody else's heart when the heart that is in my hand that is beating every single day, 24 hours a day, 300, 365 days a year, and I'm not dealing with my own heart, but I want to deal with everybody else's heart and show you how bogus you are while I sit back and I look at you and judge you falsely. This is where we're at, even as a church, where we refuse to make the hearts the hearts of the matter, our hearts. But instead, we make it about everybody else's heart rather than our own hearts. Marriages are dying right now. Christian fellowship, it has an all-time low. Folks don't even want to come to church no more, let alone have fellowship, right? Praying, reading, studying the Word of God, all these things are an all-time low. Derry gave us some, some statistics on the men's board or whatever that talked about these things. It is at an all-time low. You know why? Because we're not dealing with our own hearts and making our heart the heart of the matter. We're just concerned about everybody serving us and doing for us. And so we bring these things into our marriages, into our relationships in church, and even as parishioners toward our pastors and things of that nature, because we make it all about us in that sense, while we make it all about their heart. And we point the finger. God is telling us today, and obviously we're going to have to have a part two. And I know Derry already challenged me with that, and there it is, but God have mercy. I can't keep going because they're going to throw some at me. But listen to this. We're going to end right here with this becoming hypocrites. And I know it's ending on like a, a kind of like a, a sad note, if you were right? But can I encourage you guys before we end? Right? We talked about two things so far. This was the second thing. The first thing was legalism. The second thing is become hip hypocrites, right? Now, trust me, this sermon does get good and it does get encouraging, okay? But I had to get through the... The sinful nature stuff first, and then we get into the spirit of God's nature that lives inside of us so we can enforce that in our lives. But these two really break and make every relationship that we have. Because when you're sitting at home and you're not focusing and making your heart the heart of the matter, you're always pointing fingers at your spouse, right? And let me just say this. Your spouse may be jacked up. Let's just be honest, right? Your spouse may not be living up to what God said in his word. But even still, we still need to focus on our own hearts and say, God, my heart is the heart that matters. It's the one that I need to fix, God. Because a simple question, right, can be this in the mirror. It's talking to you married people today. The question, when, when, how does it look like, Pastor, to have my own heart and make it the heart that matters in our relationships? The simple thing is this. Could you have dealt with that situation better than what you did? Or did it expose a defiled heart? You, but I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't say you did anything wrong. I'm just saying, could you have handled that situation better if you would have looked at your own heart? Nine times out of ten, 
If you're honest, the answer would have been like, yes. I would have never cursed at my spouse. I would have never got off scripture. I would have never started bringing up Joe Osteen stuff or whatever it is, right? I would have never did any of these things or whatever, right? I would have just, you know what I mean? I would have handled it different. I would have said, you know what? We're both going to get through this and we're going to make it. That's a heart. That, that is the heart of the matter. Instead, we do the opposite. You did what? You did how? You made it like what? Come on, but I told you chicken tacos with the cheese inside and the hard shell with the soft shell. It's my favorite uh, tacos for my wife. And she made it different. I'm like, sir, something's missing. There's something. You need to put hot sauce. See, that's what I'm talking about, man. And they really got to put the hot sauce in it, right? And so it's Patty, but listen, I miss the gratefulness, the fact that she actually made the tacos from the get-go. We miss the gratefulness of the fact that our church has disciple or disciples who actually want to help you in your walk with God. And instead, we want to say how jacked up the churches is and how jacked up the people are based upon your perspective without realizing how jacked up you are as a person in Christ. And so legalism and hypocrisy are two things that we need to deal with in our own life. How have we been legalistic toward our spouses or people in our, in our lives? How have we been hypocritical toward them and not looking at ourselves so that we can better help them from a position of a heart that's already being helped? Amen? Can we all stand?